Welcome to this episode of the Catechetical Corner, ending on and defending the faith. Our culture and our church are desperately in need of a representation of what it means to be human. The work of Pope St. John Paul II from 1979 through 1983 proclaimed in 129 talks given to live papal audiences and based off a book he wrote earlier in life called Love and Responsibility laid the foundation for the prophetic teaching of the theology of the body. This timeless gift and overlooked teaching is often mistaken as sex education for Catholics, when in reality, it's a comprehensive education for humanity on the beauty and complexity of each individual's personhood and the very image and likeness of God within them. In this episode, I will share within the context of marriage preparation this beautiful teaching on God's design for a one flesh union of a man and a woman as the foundation for marriage and how family, when lived according to that design, leads to the flourishing of individuals and societies that incorporate this reality. So the first question you might be asking yourself is, uh, what is theology of the body overall? Well, um, the pontificate of John Paul, uh, St. John Paul II was a very long one and um, he gave a series of talks to public audiences from 1979 to 1984 and this became a focal point of his pontificate. And it was focused on how the body reflects something about God, about the world, about creation, uh, and God's desire to be united to each of us and to his children. And I always like to tell my students, you know, our body speaks a language. We want our body to speak the same language that our actions are speaking. So they have to be in congruence with one another and not in contradiction with one another. And that's kind of what this is all about. And I wanted to focus on the marital aspect of theology of the body since this is a marriage prep course. But there's other bigger questions about the nature of the human person that are being addressed by theology of the body. For instance, um, what does it mean to be a human being? We don't teach this stuff anymore. I don't know why we don't. Uh, we don't teach about the nature. All things that exist in the world have a nature to them. And their nature kind of directs the way they've been designed. They're designed for a specific purpose. I don't want to get too theological on you, but in Aristotelian metaphysics and in Aquinas' writings, we talk about um, formal cause, material cause, efficient cause, and final cause. And our world today has kind of eliminated two of those in materialism. It's eliminated the formal and the final cause. Formal cause means a concept, an idea. It's beyond um, materialism. It, it exists for eternity. The material cause is the matter in which that thing which is thought of is created. And the efficient cause is what you and I would see as a cause and effect within time and space. And the final cause is it's, or, it's, it's designed and ordered for a specific purpose. Our bodies have been ordered for a specific purpose as male and female in their masculinity and in their femininity. And those things that they're, they're, they're equal in dignity and integrity, male and female, equal in dignity and integrity. And, but they're different, and their differences aren't bad. They don't contradict, they complement. And when you bring the two together, you kind of start getting the answers to these things, a visible sign of the invisible reality of God's love in the world. It's kind of what we call a sacrament in the church. So um, if we have questions about these things, and people really should have questions about these things, like what does it mean to be human? How to live my life and find true beatitude, find true happiness. Theology of the body gives an answer to that. And this madness and insanity we're seeing in the world today with gender identity and all these questions about human sexuality, this is the answer to that. And unless we educate ourselves about that as Catholics and be able to articulate it in a way that people who maybe disagree with us can understand it, then we're going to continue to lose that fight in the culture. And it's going to start in the, in the world of marriage. So that's kind of some things I wanted to talk about this morning. But maybe. Um, some other questions. Why am I here? Why does God make us male and female? And ultimately, for that final cause, what's my purpose, really, overall? Who are you? Not what's your name, 
or what you're good at, but who are you? I think we've forgotten that our true identity doesn't have anything to do with the clothes we wear. In fact, it doesn't have to do with anything that we do. It can't be earned and it can't be taken away. We are sons and daughters of God. That's who we are. That is our true identity. this they and us, we and them, all it is is us. The family of God with all our different crosses, trusting in the Father who has a plan for each one of us. Now this is an invitation to go deeper, to truly look at your relationships in your life. Not just the guy relationship or the girl relationship, but all relationships. Every interaction and every relationship is meant to reveal to us something of the beauty of God and of our call to come closer to Him. And so we need to be able to trust and say, God, I choose to trust that you will fulfill the desires of my heart. We have a God who wants us to come to Him with no shame, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done. But hopefully you're realizing that being you is not all about you. You are a gift to the world when you love as God loves you. You have the power to change the world. Okay, so let's talk about marital love here, huh? It's a reflection of the inner life of the Trinity. And why did He create us male and female? So I'll start with these first two things and kind of break it down in a philosophical way for you. I just said what you do doesn't define who you are. It took me a very long time to figure that out. In a long time in my life, I had bought into the idea that what I did defined who I was. But what I do has nothing to do with my identity. I'm a child of God. That's where I get my self-worth, my value, my autonomy, and my belonging. And when we forget that, we forget who we've been created to be, and we become what the world says we should be. And oftentimes, as we live out in our marriage, and that's what other people have seen, so we need to kind of change that. And the couples that you minister to, they would rather, I'm going to quote Father Jude here. It's on my heart. They would rather see a good homily from you than hear one in your marriage. So it's really important that we live out what we believe. So who we are and what we are image God. Um, and what, like I said, all things that have been created have a nature, right? So how do we image God and who we are? And I'll come back to the sacramentality of the body and spousal analogy in just a minute. We, mirror, we, and we image God and who we are because we have an intellect and a will. We can come to know what's true, what's good, and what's beautiful. And we can choose to will it for our own benefit, but more importantly, for the benefit of other people, even to our own detriment, which is ultimately what God reveals himself to be on Calvary, a love that wills the good of other as other over himself. So we're all, that's all built into us, that's programmed into us. But we also image God in what we are, because in our human nature, we don't like to be alone. We want to be in company with, we want to be in relation with other people. Well, God is nothing more than a relation of three persons. I think a great example of that for the sacramentality of the body and the spousal analogy is, you know, in Genesis it says, um, a man leaves his mother and father and joins his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So their union is first two in one. And then nine months later, their love becomes so real, they give it a name. And now their union is no longer two in one, it's three in one. A union within a communion of three persons. 
the very inner life of the Trinity. And that's what, when you live out your marriage that way, and the world sees that self-sacrificial love between you and your spouse and your children, it mirrors the love of God the Father that he had for God the Son. And it mirrors the return love of God the Son back to God the Father on the cross. And the promise in John 14 and John 16 that he would send the Holy Spirit to God as to all truth. The exchange of love of God the Father and God the Son poured out on the family of God and humanity. So there's much more to this than just like sexual stuff with theology of the body. It's beautiful. It's deep. Our faith is deep. We've stayed in the shallow water way too long. So let's go back to the garden here for just a minute. Think about, everybody knows the story, right? When Adam and Eve are created, they're creating original holiness and original justice. They are naked without shame. They have no clothes on, but they don't see their bodies as something to be used, but rather something to be served. There's no woundedness because they haven't partaken of the tree yet and they haven't fallen and they haven't chosen to take something that belongs to God, what's right and wrong, and make it their own. And when they do that, they fall. And when they fall, they become naked with shame. And there's two ways to kind of think about that and see that. When they fall, they're naked with shame. So they kind of see each other's body. Instead of something that has to be served and to be loved and to be cherished and to be a gift, they see it as something to be used and taken and objectified. So they go and hide themselves from God. And God calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? Not because God doesn't know where Adam is. He wants Adam to know he knows where Adam is, and he knows he knows what Adam did, but he wants Adam to be held accountable for that. And Adam won't hold himself accountable for that, and he's standing right there, right, when Eve's tempted. If you read in Genesis, you're going to see he's standing right there. He doesn't choose to self-give for his wife. He chooses to self-preserve. And he falls, and Eve falls. And he says, oh, well, who, who told you to eat the tree? Well, she did. Justifying my sin. Oh, well, she, I'm not taking risk. She did it, not me. And then she passes the buck again to the serpent. Right? Uh, he, the serpent told me to do it. And you fast forward 2,000 years into the Garden of Gethsemane, and the new Adam does just the opposite. When he's presented with the exact same temptation, he doesn't self-preserve for his bride. We'll talk about this a little later on today. He's, he self-gives totally for his bride. He lays down his life for his bride, the church, you and me. So how are we living that out in our marriage, and how can people see that in our marriage? That's living out theology of the body. It's countercultural. It's going to be a sign of contradiction in the world, but it's beautiful. And another thing to think about, I have, have a child at home. He's four years old, right? Some of you said you had kids that age. You ever had him standing by the stove and like, you know, the stove's on, and you keep telling him, um, my, my little boy's name's Ezra. Hey, Ezra, Ezra, don't put your hand on the stove. You're going to burn your hand, right? I mean, everybody's had this happen to him. Uh, and what did they do? They do just the opposite, right? They go put their hand on the stove and they, they burn their hand. And when they burn their hand, they come running to you and they're ashamed because they know they did something wrong that they weren't supposed to do. Like they're, they're, the, the nature within them and their conscience tells them, I did something wrong. And they come running back to you and they're crying and they're, you're like, let me see your hand so I can put something on it. And they hide it from you because they're ashamed of what they did. So when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they became ashamed of their sin. And instead of bringing their woundedness to the one person that could heal them, God, they hid it. In our human nature, we do the same thing. <coughs> My son came to me. I'm a father. I love him. I want to help him, right? I can help him. But he's hiding his woundedness from me because he's afraid that out of fear, and that's why Adam and Eve fell in the garden. They didn't trust God. They had fear. And this kind of gives a restoration of that back to us. And we can live that out in our marriage. And it's beautiful. So we, don't be afraid to, you know, to be vulnerable. Show your weakness. Because it's there that God takes us and, and makes us an instrument to bring other people closer to himself, especially when we're ministering to other married couples. I'd have loved to have that when I was in marriage prep. I had none of that. But if I'd have had a married couple doing that for me, I think my marriage over the last 17 years would have been a little different than the way it is right now. Okay, so a little brief idea about salvation history. There's two themes in salvation history. The first one is, and this is important for understanding the, the theology behind theology of the body. In Exodus 4.22, God calls Israel his firstborn son. You all have kids in here. You all said at different ages. You can't correct a 15-year-old the way you do a one-year-old. You have to communicate to them, right, in a different way. 
You're accommodating yourself to the level of understanding they're capable of hearing when you're giving them a command. Throughout salvation history, God is taking his firstborn son and he's rehabilitating that son. He's accommodating himself to that child. So you see here's a series of covenants that God establishes with his people. And of course, after the fall, he reestablishes it with Noah, and then with Abraham, and then with Moses, and with David. And finally, he fulfills it with Jesus Christ. And each time that covenant is broken, God is slowly accommodating himself to an um, adolescent child that's growing from infancy and taught and being a toddler into adolescence, young adulthood, until it reaches full maturity. Then once it has reached full maturity, he reveals himself fully. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, In the fullness of time, God sent his only son born of the woman, the woman we heard about yesterday in Genesis 3.15 in the first reading in Mass. Right? And he sent his son born of a woman under the law to ransom those under the law so that we might receive adoption and receive the spirit of Jesus Christ within us so we can call out Abba, Father, and no longer be slaves but be sons and daughters. And Israel serves as that firstborn son, that eldest child in that family that you have that now has grown up and looks back over their life and says, oh, I get everything mom and dad did. And now I'm going to be that example for the younger siblings in the family. And reunite a broken human family from sin under one universal covenant in the Roman Catholic Church. So it's, a little, it's one theme you see in salvation history. I don't want to get bogged down on this, but I do want to point it out. The other one is very significant for theology of the body. It's the fact that throughout the Old Testament, God wants to marry Israel. The Bible starts with a wedding and it ends with one. And throughout these periods of infidelity, Israel, when it breaks its covenant, is often compared to, especially in the exile with the prophets, as being a wayward spouse that has committed several acts of adultery against God. And God is going to prune and um, purify that bride so that when he comes again at the end of time, that bride will be purified and he'll be able to unite himself to that bride for all eternity. So the second theme in salvation history is the bridegroom and the bride. And I gave you a couple of examples just to point out a few from scripture because uh, this is important. We can't catechize people about things without knowing scripture. We have sacred tradition, but we also have sacred scripture in, in the church. So here's the first one. This is from Isaiah. Let's look at it. For your husband is your maker, that would be God. The Lord of hosts is his name. Your redeemer of the Holy One of Israel, called the God of the earth. The Lord calls you back like a wife, forsaken and grieved in spirit. A wife married in youth and then cast off, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandon you, but with great tenderness, I will take you back. So God wants to marry Israel, and through Jesus Christ, he sends his only son in the incarnation to marry the world. God desires a nuptial union with each one of us, that intimate with each one of us. And that's why marital love reflects the inner life of the Trinity. And if we're living that out, we're going to give that message off to other people when they encounter us within our marriage. And you can see here, um, I, I pulled up another one from Jeremiah. There are many others. I remember the devotion of your youth, how you loved me as a bride. Oh, Israel, because the church is the new Israel. Here's one from Ezekiel. Adulterous wife, taking strangers in place of her husband. So God comes to purify and God comes to reunite. Sin divides. God created an order. Sin brings about disorder. Sin is disordered love. It's elevating something, a lesser good, a person, place, a thing, or something that's been created for us for our own well-being above the greatest good, which is God himself. This is what Israel does throughout all of ancient. It's not a statue on the wall. Idolatry is taking a lesser good and elevating it above the greatest good and ordering your life toward that instead toward God. This is what Israel did in the Old Testament. God sent Jesus to redeem us in our humanity so that we could order our life toward God and toward holiness. Here's some fulfillment of that in the New Testament. Okay, now everybody's familiar with this passage where Jesus is fasting and the Pharisees and Sadducees ask him why are they fasting and why his um, disciples are not fasting. It's in Luke 5, 33, Matthew 9, 14, and Mark chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. It's the one I pulled. So it's in all three synoptic gospels. And Jesus always talks about himself as God in the third person in the New Testament. He refers to himself indirectly. He's implying it so that the people who had an explicit foreknowledge to understand it would be able to receive it and choose whether they wanted to follow him or not. Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answered them, 
Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? He's talking about himself. So for a Jew who had been waiting on God to come as the eternal bridegroom to purify Israel and be reunited to him, he's saying without saying it, I'm the God of Israel. And they would have understood that in a very clear way. Because they're not reading something into scripture from the 21st century. They're reading it in first time, you know, first century understanding. They're, they're drawing something out of what he's saying because they've been expecting it, so they get it. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, of course, he's talking about when he's going to be crucified. He's going to be in the tomb for a while. And then they would fast because the bridegroom would be absent. And if you go a little further along in the St. Paul's letters, we have 13 of them in the New Testament. In uh, the second letter to the Corinthians, you can see that as a, um, an apostle, one who is sent with authority, and he has preached the gospel, the one that was handed on to him by Jesus Christ, adding nothing to it and taking nothing away from it. He has preached and established a church within Corinth. And he is saying to them, as the bride of Christ, I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And if we go to the end of scripture, in the book of Revelation, we can see where the lamb, which is the paschal lamb that's been sacrificed, that's Jesus Christ. 28 times in 22 chapters, he's called the, the lamb of God in the book of Revelation. We can see that the Lamb now is there, right? Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding day of the Lamb has come. That's what we do at Mass, right? We're going to hear Father Jude say those beautiful words today at Mass when we go in a little while, huh? Behold the Lamb of God, behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. We're the bride. Covenant is not contractual, it's an exchange of persons. I belong to you and you belong to me. That is what we say when we get married. So we're being purified to be the bride of Christ. Theology of the body says something about all this. It's beautiful. His bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Come here, I will, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So really, um, you see, this is why the church can't change, change its teaching on marriage, because its job is to defend divine revelation, add nothing to it, and take nothing away from it. It's not that they can say, like, Yes, it, no to that. It doesn't have the authority to say yes to that. And if God revealed himself within a Trinitarian union between a man and a woman in marriage, that visible sign of his invisible reality in the world, it's eternal. It doesn't change. We're not supposed to change it. It's supposed to change us. Throughout history and around the world, Marriage has been the universal institution upon which civilization rests. Marriage has long captivated the hearts of artists, poets, writers, and storytellers. But the true meaning of marriage goes deeper than fairy tale endings. It is so much more than that. Marriage was God's idea from the beginning. He created man and woman for each other and set their union as a firm foundation for the family. Jesus raised marriage from an important institution to a grace-filled sacrament. Now, this sacrament of service is a place where God pours His love into the life of a couple. Through their promises of fidelity, total self-gift, and openness to children, a husband and wife are called to walk through life together, always faithful to the vows they professed on their wedding day. The Greek word for mystery is mysterion. 
The Latin word there is sacramentum. What do you think the English word is? Sacrament. Marriage is a sacrament. So when I look at my own relationship with my wife, no doubt when I met my wife I was in love with her, no doubt that I had given her acts of love. But the real question I needed to ask myself was, not is this, uh, you know, do I love in this particular instance, is, does this act of love mirror Christ's love for the church? And if it doesn't, then it's really not an act of love. It's just the opposite of that. That's what theology of the body teaches. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. It's a powerful line in Ephesians. It's one that's impacted me as a husband quite a bit in the last 10 years of my life. After my son was born, What is love? I use this line in my talk, I'm gonna use it today. Our culture today is reduced to empty sentimentality and emotional overtone. But when you read in 1 John 4, 8, it says, whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. And the, the one we hear at weddings all the time, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse four through eight, you know, love is patient, love is kind. It's not rude, it's not pompous, it's not jealous. It's not quick-tempered, self-seeking, doesn't brood over injury or rejoice in wrongdoing, it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That love did not fail on Calvary, and you know what? It will not fail in your marriage. That love is a decision, it's not a feeling. If Christ didn't make a, a decision based on feeling, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. The only thing the world is more confused about than the nature of the human person is the authentic definition of love. Just as the Roman Empire was approaching its own internal corruption and later fall, we too, in modern America, are doing the same in our obsession with disordered erotic sexuality. Mistaking emotional highs and lows and perverse sexual activity for true love at the expense of reason and the fulfillment we long for and could achieve if we only cooperated with the God-given design of our body. Our bodies indeed speak a language of love, but that love must mirror the love of Christ on the cross or it slips into a disordered action that ignores sacrificial love and perpetuates a counterfeit love of erotic use. To quote Pope St. John Paul II, the authentic love we have for others is the amount of responsibility we are willing to take for them. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Catechetical Corner. And join us next time for the conclusion of this amazing teaching on the theology of the body. God love you, and we'll see you next time.